I'm going to begin by saying a few words, not very many, about mast cell biology and why mast cells are important in causation of allergic disease. I'm going to talk about systemic mastocytosis because oftentimes people are concerned that they may have mastocytosis and there is confusion about the nature of overlap between various types of mast cell activation disorders, one of which and perhaps the rarest of which is systemic mastocytosis. And then I'm going to talk more generally about mast cell activation syndromes and specifically about the triad of mast cell activation syndrome, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, and hypermobile EDS. There is also another uncommon form of mast cell activation syndrome, which is monoclonal mast cell activation syndrome, which is perhaps a little bit more closely related to systemic mastocytosis. And I'll touch briefly on that in the context of idiopathic anaphylaxis. And finally, but not in this order, I'm going to talk about hereditary alpha tryptasemia, which is a genetic condition which has as part of its presentation features of mast cell activation syndrome. So let's begin with a cartoon of what a mast cell looks like. And this is in the imagination of the person who's drawn this, but it shows some of the characteristics of a mast cell. Now, the mast cell is integral to causing allergic reactions. It's filled with chemicals, and those chemicals are called mediators because they mediate various of the manifestations of an allergic reaction. And those chemicals are stored in granules. Those are those little round bubbles that are shown within the cell. On the cell surface of mast cells are receptors. And there's one important receptor which binds to IgE, which is the allergy causing antibody. So that's called the IgE receptor. There's a second important receptor, which is called the KIT receptor, and that's spelled K-I-T. And the KIT receptor is one that binds another molecule, which helps to regulate mast cell growth and mast cell maturation and mast cell activation. And sometimes that KIT receptor becomes mutated and it drives the mast cell to proliferate, to divide, and to form abnormally increased numbers, and that might be in skin or bone marrow or elsewhere. And that's what leads to the condition called systemic mastocytosis. This is yet another cartoon, and this shows what a mast cell looks like when it becomes activated, and the granules are released from within the mast cell into the extracellular environment. When those granules are released, the chemicals within them are also released, and the chemicals will bind to various receptors, and they give rise to all of the common features that we recognize in aller as an allergic reaction. And those features might be itching, they might be redness, they may be hives, they may be bronchospasm of the airways, they may be a fall in blood pressure in the case of anaphylaxis. Now, this is in real life what a mast cell looks like under the microscope. So to your left, you see a mast cell that has not been activated and the granules are inside. When the mast cell is activated, it's released. The granules are released from within the mast cell and the chemical mediators are also released from within those granules and they can act on nearby, nearby blood vessels and they can act on other structures nearby and that could be blood vessels or it could be the airways, or it can be the GI tract and cause spasm of the GI tract and diarrhea. So there are a whole host of potential manifestations of allergic reactions. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later on. So once again, we return to a cartoon and you see the receptors at the very top of this schematic, and there are the IgE antibodies bound to the receptor and they're sitting there in wait, waiting for an antigen, and in the case of allergies, we call that an allergen, to appear to bind to the receptors, activate the mast cell, and release the granule contents, and you'll see that at the bottom left of your screen. In this cartoon, 
The thing that I want to point out that's especially important and relevant to you and to our circumstances is that there are many chemical mediators that are released from mast cells. All of us are familiar with histamine as a chemical mediator, and many of us will be familiar with antihistamine medications, which block the action of histamine at its receptor. But the thing that I want to point out, which is very important, is that histamine is only one of many chemical mediators that are released from mast cells. And as a result, an antihistamine medication will not be effective against uh, the action of all of these other various chemical mediators, it blocks only histamine and nothing else, which means that its effectiveness is going to be very limited. And oftentimes we have to use other medications to block other chemicals. For example, near the bottom right, you'll see leukotriene C4 and B4 and D2 and prostaglandin E2. And those are so-called lipid mediators and a drug called Montelukast will block the action of leukotrienes at the level of its receptor, and aspirin will block the synthesis of the prostaglandins. So mast cell activation diseases are a group of disorders. They're characterized by one of two things, and these two things can occur together. So they can be characterized by increased numbers of pathological mast cells, so abnormal mast cells that accumulate typically in the bone marrow, but they can accumulate in the skin, in the gut, in liver and lymph nodes and elsewhere. Or a mast cell activation disorder can be caused by abnormal release of mast cell chemicals or mast cell mediators. In some individuals who have accumulations of pathological or abnormal mast cells, those mast cells are driven to release chemical mediators, and people will then have both of these conditions that are fulfilled. So that would typically be seen in somebody who has indolent systemic mastocytosis, where there are more than the usual numbers of mast cells in the body, and those mast cells release inappropriately, they release chemical mediators and the person becomes very highly symptomatic as a result of too many mast cells and abnormal release of their mediators. So here are the typical symptoms of mast cell activation. And you'll recognize these as the characteristic types of symptoms that we see during allergic reactions. And they include itching and hives, flushing, dermographism, swelling in the throat amongst other things and there can be asthmatic type symptoms in the lower airways in the lungs crampy abdominal pain vomiting diarrhea and full-blown anaphylaxis so here you see a depiction of facial flushing and it ex it extends into the anterior chest the v of the chest in many people and flushing can occur in other places as well that's caused by dilation or enlargement of blood vessels in the skin. This shows hives. Hives are red raised itchy bumps. They look a lot like mosquito bites, although they can take various shapes and forms and they can be intensely itchy. For the most part, they tend to be transient. They last from minutes to hours, but usually not more than that, although they do tend to recur day after day. And this is dermographism that we typically see with mast cell disorders. These are long, itchy, linear welts that occur when somebody scratches their skin. So let's turn to diagnostic criteria for mast cell activation syndrome. There are three criteria that have to be fulfilled in order to make a formal diagnosis. The first of these is a person has to experience typical systemic symptoms that are characteristically produced by mediators or chemicals that come from mast cells. Oftentimes those symptoms involve two or more organ systems. So somebody may have flushing and itching in hives and they may also have crampy abdominal pain and diarrhea as an example. We should also be able to document an increase in one of the markers of mast cell activation, and that is a serum tryptase level. If the tryptase level is high to begin with, then 
that already points to mast cell activation or sometimes something related, hereditary alpha tryptasemia. But if the tryptase level is within the normal range, if we then repeat it when the symptoms flare up, we would expect to see at least a 20% increase over baseline to which we add another two micrograms per liter. So let's say we begin with five micrograms per liter at baseline at 20%, that gets us up to six micrograms per liter, and then add another two micrograms per liter to that, which is eight. So if we go from five to eight, that's considered significant, even though it's still within the reference range, which is 3.8 to 11.4 micrograms per liter. The blood test should be done typically within two hours, but sometimes as much as three to four hours from the start of a reaction in order to be valid. The final criterion is to be able to demonstrate a significant reduction in symptoms of mast cell activation when we use medications that block the mediators at the level of their receptors or medications that stabilize mast cells. And those might be medications such as ketotophen or chromalin or Zolaire or omalizumab. So here is a list of various mast cell activation diseases. Let's begin with something called a clonal mast cell activation disease, and that's called systemic mastocytosis. It's referred to as a clonal disorder because the cells in systemic mastocytosis arise from a single mutated clone. And that clone becomes autonomous, which means that it grows independently of growth factors. And that's because of a mutation in the KIT receptor that I pointed out earlier on the surface of mast cells. When there aren't too many of the excessive numbers of mast cells in bone marrow, that's called indolent systemic mastocytosis. But the mastocytosis can become increasingly more aggressive and it moves from indolent in some cases to smoldering to aggressive systemic mastocytosis and rarely to mast cell leukemia. So those are called clonal disorders. That's not what we're talking about in the context of hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. There is then a separate category called mast cell activation syndrome of which there are basically two types. So here's an algorithm which walks you through that. If somebody has the criteria that are fulfilled for mast cell activation syndrome, and those are the three that I showed before, meaning appropriate symptoms referable to mast cell mediators, an elevated, um, uh, an elevated marker of mast cell activation, namely a serum tryptase level, and finally, suppression of those symptoms by medications that target mast cells, then we consider either a clonal mast cell disorder like cutaneous mastocytosis or systemic mastocytosis or monoclonal mast cell activation syndrome. And then there are the so-called secondary mast cell activation syndromes. And those are the common day-to-day -day types of allergies. They can be hives, they can be allergies in the eyes and nose, itchy red watery eyes, runny nose and sneezing with, for example, seasonal allergies or cat allergy. Or they can be anaphylaxis. All of those would qualify as secondary mast cell activation syndromes. And then a little bit further to the left, you'll see what are termed the idiopathic mast cell activation syndromes. And that's, for the most part, what we're dealing with in this context. Now, this is a very complicated and busy slide, and I'm not gonna dwell on it, except to remind you that there are these two receptors on the surface of the mast cells, one of which to your left is called the KIT receptor. And that's important for the clonal mast cell disorders because that's the receptor that becomes mutated that causes increased numbers of mast cells. And when somebody develops either cutaneous, meaning limited to the skin, or systemic mastocytosis, then they're prone to having all sorts of symptoms, which can range from mild itching all the way through to anaphylaxis. There are some diagnostic criteria that were established by the World Health Organization, 
I'm not going to go through those because they don't bear on today's discussion. But again, I want to point out that there are very clear, rigorous distinctions between systemic mastocytosis and the kinds of mast cell activation syndromes that we see in the context of EDS and POTS. So here's a normal mast cell to your left and on the right, clusters of abnormal mast cells. These form what are called aggregates. The shape of the mast cells in mastocytosis is abnormal. They're called spindled mast cells, and they typically occur in the bone marrow beside bony trabeculae. So this is an iceberg depiction of various types of mast cell disorders. The rarest is at the very top, and that's mast cell leukemia. And underneath that are various types of systemic mastocytosis and cutaneous mastocytosis. Then there are the secondary forms, the urticarias, the hives, and the swelling, and allergies and anaphylaxis. And then we come to the most common presentations, which is what I want to spend the rest of my talk about, which is the mast cell activation syndromes, which are typically called idiopathic mast cell activation syndrome. So let's just for one more moment consider systemic mastocytosis. This is a 34-year-old man, multiple anaphylactic reactions to stinging insects, and in his case, yellow jacket. And here's an example of a reaction. He was stung on his left temple. He developed very quickly swelling of both hands. He became lightheaded and he passed out. He needed two doses of epinephrine for resuscitation. When we examined his skin, he had typical changes that we see in mastocytosis of a condition called urticaria pigmentosa. I'll show you that in the next slide. His blood test confirmed allergy to stinging insects and his tryptase level was markedly elevated at 20. Remember the upper limit of normal is 11.4. And here you see a picture of cutaneous mastocytosis or urticaria pigmentosa. A bone marrow biopsy was done and it confirmed the presence of systemic mastocytosis and he was treated appropriately with medications he was desensitized to the venom that he was allergic to, and he was treated with Zolaire, and he's not had any further reactions. We're going to leave mastocytosis behind, and now we're going to get to the nitty-gritty, which is mast cell activation syndrome. I think that all of us now know that there is a very close linkage of mast cell activation syndrome, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, and hypermobile EDS. And these, in this particular study, we looked at patients who have mast cell activation syndrome, and we looked to see what proportion of them might have co-segregation with POTS and with hypermobile EDS or hypermobile spectrum disorder. We confirmed the diagnosis of mast cell activation syndrome by looking at validated symptoms of mast cell activation and elevated markers of mast cell activation. The demographics and comorbid conditions were examined, including those of POTS and uh, congenital connective tissue disorders. And in this particular cohort, we had 30 people who had mast cell activation syndrome, according to our working definition that I showed you before. Seven of these 30 had coexistent POTS, and 13 had a connective tissue disorder as well. Six of the 30 individuals had all three. They had mast cell activation syndrome, POTS, and hypermobile EDS. So it's not uncommon for these three disorders to co-segregate. For the most part, individuals who are affected are female. You can see more than 90%. And the ages range from teen all the way through to mid-50s. The kinds of conditions that we see in conjunction with this triad of conditions are listed over here, and they include asthma, allergies in the eyes and nose, anaphylaxis, multiple drug allergies, reactions to stinging insects, irritable bowel syndrome, celiac disease, and others. So when we look at postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, just like mast cell activation syndrome, there's a strong female predominance 
And the thing that I want to impress upon you is that autoimmunity is very commonplace in people who have POTS. Anti-nuclear antibody, anti-phospholipid antibody, autoimmune thyroid disease, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, and immunodeficiency are very commonplace. The numbers that you see in brackets are odds ratios, which means how likely is somebody who has POTS to have this disorder over and above that of the general population. Here are some additional antibodies that are seen in people who have POTS. And these are antibodies directed against receptors in the cardiovascular system. And this is in pot, in part rather, why it is that people who have POTS have dysregulated cardiovascular responses because these antibodies interfere with normal signaling through the cardiovascular system. Now, people with hypermobile EDS also have increased risk of autoimmunity. There's about a 2.3 uh, times increased likelihood of celiac disease and a relative risk of eight times eosinophilic esophagitis above that of the general population. So I'd like to turn to tryptase. For those of you who've been investigated for mast cell activation syndrome, you've had tryptase levels drawn at baseline and you've likely had tryptase levels also drawn when your symptoms flare up. Why is it that we look at tryptase? Well, it's an enzyme that's released from mast cells when they're activated, but it's also an enzyme that's released when mast cells are at rest. There's two different types of tryptase. There's a beta tryptase that's released with mast cell activation, such as with anaphylaxis, and an alpha tryptase that trickles out of mast cells all the time. When the alpha tryptase levels are increased, then we know that the person's, uh, that person has more than their usual burden of mast cells throughout their body. When the beta tryptase levels are released, then we know that their mast cells are being activated. So alpha tryptase correlates to total body mast cell burden and beta tryptase is a marker of mast cell activation. The genes that code for tryptase are the ones at the bottom of your screen. And the most important area on the uh, genome that encodes for tryptase is a locus called TPSAB1. Now, in, there is a condition called hereditary alpha tryptasemia. In the general population, somewhere between four to 6% of the population has higher than normal levels of basal serum tryptase. So in other words, their tryptase levels are typically elevated above 11.4, but they're generally within the teens. They're not in the range that we see with mastocytosis, which may be 20, 60, 100, or 200. So the basal serum tryptase levels are regulated by genes that are inherited in what's called an autosomal dominant manner. So if one parent has it, the likelihood that their child will inherit it is one in two. People who have elevated basal serum tryptase levels have a number of complaints that correlate to the presence of elevated basal serum tryptase. And these are flushing and itching, irritable bowel syndrome, abdominal pain, sometimes constipation, sometimes diarrhea chronic pain, dysautonomia, and that can be in the form of gastropore gastroparesis, or it can be swallowing disorders, or bladder disorders, or cardiovascular disorders. Joint hypermobility is often seen in hereditary alpha tryptasemia, and then full-blown anaphylaxis, sometimes sporadically, just out of the blue, and sometimes following insect stings. So, the increase in tryptase is caused by duplication or triplication of the genes that code for alpha tryptase at the TPSAB1 locus. And in this particular study, there were a large number of families that had multi-system complaints and had elevated tryptase levels. And remember, this is called hereditary alpha tryptasemia, which means, of course, that it's inherited from parents to children. The individuals who had 
three alleles or three genes that coded for basal serum tryptase had higher levels of tryptase, and they were more symptomatic than individuals who had duplication of the genes that coded for tryptase. So in other words, the more copies of the gene a person has, the more symptomatic they're likely to be. And in a large study of 170 odd people who had elevated basal serum tryptase, the duplications were noted in the gene coding for alpha tryptase, and that was associated with irritable bowel syndrome, dysautonomia, connective tissue disorders, and skin symptoms like itching and flushing and hives. So you've already heard a lot of this. Individuals with elevated basal serum tryptase have dysmotility of the gastrointestinal tract, and that's often in the form of irritable bile syndrome, but it can be other things like swallowing or esophageal dysmotility. It can be gastroparesis where the stomach doesn't empty properly or the bowels don't empty properly. It can cause chronic acid reflux and joint hypermobility, uh, retention of baby teeth, um, pains in the joints, body pains, POTS, flushing, itching, and anaphylaxis to stinging insects. So again, there's a greater prevalence of these clinical symptoms that goes along in individuals who have more than the normal numbers of copies of the gene that codes for alpha tryptase. But the curious thing is, mast cells that are derived from blood of these individuals with hereditary alpha tryptasemia don't show abnormal growth, they don't show an abnormal shape, and they don't appear to show abnormal function, making them very different than individuals who have systemic mastocytosis. So it becomes curious as to why individuals with hereditary alpha tryptasemia show symptoms of mast cell activation, and yet their mast cells, at least in the test tube, don't become activated. So there is a syndrome that's been coined after individuals who have hereditary alpha tryptasemia, and it's a disorder caused by a single gene, so it's a monogenic disorder, and there are increased prevalences of multiple symptoms that go along with that. And these are the ones that I've already pointed out in the previous couple of slides. Because individuals who have hereditary alpha tryptasemia have symptoms that look like and behave like mast cell mediator release, it's often assumed that people have systemic mastocytosis, so they end up undergoing a bone marrow biopsy where it may not be necessary, and the bone marrow biopsy will oftentimes turn out to be negative and non-diagnostic. So here's an individual to illustrate the point. This is a 22-month-old little girl who was referred from the hospital for sick children with symptoms of mast cell activation, and she had flushing of her face, trunk, legs, and arms. The areas of flushing were hot, but not itchy, and she was better with antihistamines. She was irritable. She drew her knees up to her chest with clear, crampy abdominal pain and loose stools. She appeared to be intolerant to many foods, and she ended up on a very, very restricted diet. Um, skin tests were negative, but she couldn't tolerate cow's milk and soy. She developed bloating, flushing, screaming, and vomiting. So she was treated with H1 antihistamines and H2 antihistamine ranitidine. Her tryptase level was elevated above 11.4 on a couple of occasions. So that raised the possibility that she has hereditary alpha tryptasemia. And we did a TPSAB1 copy number analysis, and sure enough, she had twice the number of genes that codes for alpha tryptase that she should have. So the test showed extra allelic alpha tryptase copies at TPSAB1 with a confirmed diagnosis of hereditary alpha tryptasemia. And she did very, very well on a combination of H1 and H2 antihistamines and a mast cell stabilizer, chromalin. And one other patient, a 56-year-old with recurring facial flushing and swelling who had dysautonomia that was confirmed on tilt table testing, which was positive for POTS. 
oftentimes itchy and prickly skin, recurring episodes of flushing, hives, dermographism, tightness in her throat, wheezing, tightness in her chest, shortness of breath, bloating, vomiting, cramps, loose stools, and orthostatic intolerance, and uh, a severe sting reaction. There were other triggers of mast cell activation that we typically ask about, and we ask about things like alcohol and opiates because these are known to trigger mast cells to activate, as does high temperature and strenuous activity. Her tryptase level was elevated into the teens. Other investigations were negative, and a copy number analysis again confirmed the diagnosis of hereditary alpha tryptasemia. I want to finish in my final one or two slides with idiopathic anaphylaxis. Mast cell activation syndrome can present with anaphylaxis without any clear apparent triggers, so unprovoked anaphylaxis. And in fact, when we look at people who have anaphylaxis that's unexplained, that's often the case, and then it becomes a real puzzle as to why it happens. So idiopathic means that the person has been exhaustively investigated, known and recognized causes of anaphylaxis have been ruled out, and the person is then given a diagnosis by exclusion of idiopathic anaphylaxis, and by exclusion meaning we've excluded other known causes. So these individuals have unprovoked episodes of anaphylaxis where their blood pressure falls, tryptase levels rise, and the question has arisen as to whether these people might have clonal disorders of mast cells. So in this paper, and this was about 15 years ago, a group of individuals who had been thoroughly investigated and were given diagnoses of idiopathic anaphylaxis underwent bone marrow biopsies. Five of the 12 were found to have clonal disorders of mast cells, and so that amounted to 42%. So it's clear that a minority of individuals with idiopathic anaphylaxis will have an abnormal type of mast cell clone. More recently, it's been shown that the remainder have hereditary alpha tryptasemia. So now we know when other causes have been ruled out to look for this genetic mutation for increased numbers of genes that code for alpha tryptase. The test itself is easy. It's a swab with a Q-tip of the inside of the cheek. The uh, swab is sent down to a genetic laboratory in Texas. They will turn around the result in about six weeks time and we'll have an answer. And here you see the outcome of the studies of bone marrow biopsies in individuals with idiopathic anaphylaxis. And you'll see that in some instances, they had normal levels of tryptase, patient number one and patient number five. And in other three cases, they had uh, tryptase levels that were elevated. So I've covered a lot of territory. I've talked about clonal mast cell disorders. Those are cutaneous, manif uh, cutaneous mastocytosis, systemic mastocytosis, and monoclonal mast cell activation syndrome. And then I've talked about other types of mast cell activation disorders, and those include idiopathic mast cell activation syndrome and hereditary alpha tryptasemia. We've looked at how that overlaps with idiopathic anaphylaxis. And I've talked about the fact that individuals with systemic mastocytosis and with hereditary alpha tryptasemia have an increased risk of anaphylaxis to insect stings. So there is a great deal of overlap. There is a great deal to muddle through. The evaluations are time consuming with lots of questions and a good number of tests. But our aim is to tease apart those individuals who have the so-called idiopathic form of mast cell activation syndrome, because that's very amenable to appropriate treatment, but we wanna make sure that we exclude other forms where the treatments are quite different. So with that, I'll end on this final slide. Thank you very much for your attention, and I would be happy to answer your questions.